This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation-funded project hosted by Northeastern University that promotes public scholarship on religion. I highly recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website, sacred-rights.org, that's W-R-I-T-E-S, or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. The ways religion has been used as a tool for marginalization and division is well documented by numerous historians, researchers, and scholars. However, claiming a spiritual space and establishing a spiritual community will always find a way, even after being unwelcomed in some spaces. The Metropolitan Community Church is one such spiritual community which flourished in the aftermath of rejection. Founded in the 1960s, the Metropolitan Community Church's website states the denomination has, quote, been at the vanguard of civil and human rights movements by addressing important issues such as racism, sexism, homophobia, ageism, and other forms of oppression. MCC has been on the forefront in the struggles towards marriage equality in the U.S. and other countries worldwide and continues to be a powerful voice in the LGBT equality movement, end quote. The Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco has an important history surrounding the HIV and AIDS outbreak in the 1980s. The history of this location is all at once beautiful, humbling, haunting, and above all, essential to remember. Among the sources for that history and remembering are hundreds of audio tapes of MCCSF services. The historian examining and writing about this history is Dr. Lynn Gerber. Dr. Lynn Gerber is an independent scholar and is the author of Seeking the Straight and Narrow, released from University of Chicago Press in 2011. She is currently working on a history of religion and HIV AIDS in San Francisco and a chapter on that subject, We Who Must Die Demand a Miracle, Christmas 1989 at the Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco, appears in the volume Devotions and Desires, Histories of Sexuality and Religion in the 20th Century United States. She also has work in Religion Dispatches and an appearance on the Sexing History podcast. You can find links to a few of these resources in the show notes, and you can find Dr. Gerber on Twitter at Gerber underscore Lynn, and that's Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E. So without further delay, I really hope you enjoy this fantastic conversation I have with Dr. Lynn Gerber on the history of the Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco. Dr. Lynn Gerber, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. Can you just start off a little bit by introducing yourself a little bit to the audience so they know who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Lynn Gerber. Um, I'm an independent scholar, and I live and work in San Francisco. Fabulous. Well, Lynn, I want to trace a little bit of your academic journey because the histories that you write about are so incredibly important to me personally that I need to know a little bit about your path to lead you to this point. So what are some of your stepping stones that led you down the path that you have traveled until today? Well, let's see. I grew up in New York on Long Island. I grew up in a Jewish community, a very Jewish community. And I grew up going to a Hebrew day school, a Salman Schechter school, which is like a parochial school for Jews. When I went to high school, I went to a secular, a public high school. But when I was in high school, my father died in 1984. And my way of responding to that was going to synagogue. I I decided that I was going to say the Kaddish for him every day for a year, which is Jewish tradition to do. And even though I was young, I was 15, um, I decided that that's what I needed to do to 
grieve. Um, and I mention that only because given the project that I'm working now in retrospect, that seems very significant because in this period in 1984, which is three years after the first cases of HIV, I, as a kid, uh, felt that religious community was the place where grief was supported, it could be expressed, it was, it was a survival mechanism for me. And now I find myself in this position of studying a religious community that is sort of saturated in grief and thinks about um, how congregations are the kind of space where that kind of communal loss can be held. So mm. that's an interesting marker that's not so much academic, but it's become more significant to me as I think about it in the context of my current work. I love that. What was your undergrad like? What did you like? What were you interested in? Like whenever you started going to post secondary education? I went to College of Brandeis and I was originally planning to become a rabbi and then realized that I did not exactly have the uh, psychological and emotional characteristics mm. that make for good clergy. <laughs> but I um, got very interested in women's studies and the school that I went to didn't have a general religious studies program. They only had a Jewish studies program and I got interested in a variety of religions, but what they had was an, the ability to create your own major, an independent concentration. So I did an independent major in women and religion and that was where I really started bringing together sort of feminism, women's studies. It was then women's studies. It was the 80s. So it was still then just women's studies and um, the study of religion together. And then I started a master's program at Harvard Divinity School, which has a long history of talking about women and gender studies and religion and sort of continued the conversation there. Mm. When I went to the Div School, um, I was following another path as well. I worked in social movement philanthropy, um, giving money to social justice efforts and efforts at redistributing power along with redistributing money and worked founding an organization that is devoted to people giving their money towards social justice causes and was really on a dual path. I couldn't really decide, am I going to work in social justice philanthropy or am I gonna do the academic work and really swung back and forth for a while. But when I got the organization that I co-founded to a place where it could live on its own, I realized it was my moment to either just do that for the rest of my life or go back to school and do academia. So I decided to go back to school and do academia and did a doctorate here at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Awesome. That is so yeah. cool. Do you have yeah. any like major mentors or anybody along your path that really helped you sort of like find your, your writing voice, your scholarly path? Does anybody want to like sort of give shout out to? Well, there's a number. One that was really, I think the really life changing, I really want to do this from my work experience was when I first went to HDS, my very first semester, I took a, a lift religion course with David Hall. It was the first time he ever took it and he ever taught it. And one of the assignments was he had one of his former students who became a minister. He was a Presbyterian minister somewhere in Pennsylvania. He sent them a year's worth of church bulletins and the assignment was just read the church bulletins and, and figure something out about this church and the world that it lives in and what was happening in it. And there was something about that experience, that assignment that really just kind of opened my imagination about what religious studies look like beyond sort of denominational history or ecclesial history or the theological history, but that you can learn about a social world by looking at a church bulletin for a year. Now, of course, all I do is look at church bulletins and laugh at myself and my former self and say, yeah, well, that's what you get for liking this so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, and then beyond that, it would be innumerable to, to mention the mentors and people who have really shaped me. Although I will say that I'm somebody who is deeply shaped by my own cohort of people and that the people that I went through with and that I've developed intellectual friendships with over the years, that those are really the scholarly relationships and conversations that sustain me in addition to the teachers and the mentors and the books and like the great thoughts and the things that are on that sort of higher plane, the ongoing daily working conversations with people who are working out their own things, but we do it in tandem is really the heart of, I would call it like intellectual intimacy for me. And it's mm. very meaningful to me and really important. That's so well said. Well, and speaking of a cohort, you are a part of a current cohort with the 2020 Sacred Rights cohort of, um, you know, it's a fellowship of public scholarship. 
which I am doing, I'm talking to all of you right now. And it's so inspiring for me to hear all about your amazing projects and this academic path that you've traveled and the histories that you write about have led you to be a member of this fabulous cohort. And I'm curious if you can tell me a little bit about why you applied to the fellowship and maybe a little bit about what kind of skills you feel you are adding to your scholarship toolbox as you go through all the trainings and everything that you all do. Yeah, Sacred Rights is amazing. They, the folks who are leading that transition, this program from an in-person one-week event to a 10-unit, six-month-long virtual experience, and they have done such an amazing job. I have so much respect for what they do. What I, I applied in part because I, the work I do as an academic, I write by my own, but my current project is based on an audio archive. And I've known since the beginning that part of what I wanted to do is use that audio archive to tell the story of MCC San Francisco to a wider audience. But I was never entirely sure how. I have um, two collaborators who I work with on that side of my work, on the audio side of my work, uh, Siri Colum and Ariana Nettleman. And the three of us together are committed to thinking about how to use this audio material to get this story out more. And I thought that Sacred Rights would be a fantastic way to really think through that project and give me some tools and give the three of us some tools really to plan, to position, to articulate what a piece looks like in a more public facing format. And I really wanted to do that for that reason. The other reason that I was really interested in this year in particular is because 2021 is the 40th anniversary of the first cases of HIV emerging mm. in the United States. And I wanted to have a plan. Um, back in the day, I had a fantasy that the book that I am writing would come out in 2021. That fantasy has long since expired, but I still wanted a plan. Um, and so 2020 was the great it was a great opportunity to say, oh, look, I'll have some lead time. I'll be able to develop some skills and then I'll really be able to get something out or be a voice in the conversation that I'm sure will emerge around this anniversary. So that's so fabulous. Well, yeah. Lynn, um, I want to know a lot about your project. We're going to go into tons of detail here. And you're essentially writing the history of the Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco, and you're writing a lot about the AIDS crises of the uh, 1980s and 1990s. But I'm curious about what you got, what got you interested in the Metropolitan Community Church, either the denomination um, entirely, but you know what? Tell me what, how you got interested in this topic in the first place. Yeah, well, my first book was on evangelicals and bodily changes that don't really work out. I did a, I wrote a book that compared ex-gay ministries and Christian weight loss groups. And I was very interested in questions of the body and morality and how religion moralizes the body, moralizes bodily experience, um, advocates for change, doesn't advocate for change and makes moral sense of what our embodied experience is like. In some ways, this is very much an extension of that work because questions of the body and morality in how religious groups responded to HIV is obviously front and center. But the way I got to this particular story is um, it's a little roundabout. Mm -hmm. So um, when I first moved to San Francisco, I, like I said, I was a student at the Graduate Theological Union, which is a seminary that that trains MCC ministers in formation. And there was a woman in my one of my classes, Tessie Mandeville, who was like, oh, you live in San Francisco, you should come to my church. And I was like, I'm not Christian. She was like, I don't care, come to my church. It's a gay and lesbian church, it'll be great. I'm like, I'm not a lesbian. She's like, come to my church, I don't care. <laughs> so I came to her church on a Sunday night. Um, I am not a church goer, but I went to her church and I loved it. It was lovely. It was, they had services on Sunday night. I'm not a morning person. I'm like Sunday night. I can totally do this. I love there it. Was, <laughs> there was great music. Um, the people were warm and friendly and I was new to the city. So I was like, this is great. So I started going just as a friend to the church. I never anticipated studying it. I never joined the church. I'm Jewish. I, it's not in my DNA to join a church. It's not something I could do, but I 
was very, very fond of it. And I became a friend to this congregation. And the way the congregation is structured is that to make decisions, they often need a non-church member there to like witness them or something. I became like basically their Shabbos goy, right? Like that, mm. that's what I was for them. Um, and then when I did my dissertation on the ex-gay movement, I kind of stepped back in part because I didn't want the people that I was trying to interview in the ex-gay movement think I was sketchy because I had an affiliation with gay church, even mm-hmm. though I wasn't a member, but I was, you know, I was there. Um, so I took a big step back and I never really anticipated studying it. What happened was um, by a set of circumstances, I got a grant to study how congregations address trauma. And I did that working with MCC San Francisco. And that project didn't really go anywhere. But in the course of doing that project, I got introduced to this audio archive that the church had preserved, that one member of the church had preserved, of 1,200 audio cassettes that recorded the worship services of this congregation starting in 1987. So two services a Sunday, every Sunday for 20 odd years Mm. they had preserved in cassette form and I was between things I had finished my first book I was still on the job market I wasn't sure where I was going to land and I thought okay so as a side project I'll just catalog these tapes because they seem really interesting um I don't know that it's my project but it's a project and I can help the church out for a while while I sort of situate myself well famous last words I got completely sucked into this archive which is sort of the second reason how I got interested. One, I was already friendly with the congregation, and then I fell in love with this source. I mean, listening to week after week of prayers, of singing, of sermons, of announcements, who's in the hospital, who died this week, whose parents are in town, who needs a prayer, what political things are going on, just listening to that play out in time. I was seduced, truly, and um, dove in and have not gotten out yet and don't anticipate getting out anytime soon. I mean, it was so, it was such a, there was something about listening to it. There was a sensuousness. It was such a, it was such an evocative format that I got completely taken with it. And then as I started thinking about it as an intellectual project, what I got interested in is how First of all, in American religion, American religious history, the story of the second half of the 20th century is almost all the rise of evangelicals. And here's a case of a deeply progressive, radical church experiment that kind of never gets talked about in that history. I mean, AIDS hardly ever gets discussed at all with some notable exceptions, but in the sort of trajectory of 20th century American religion, it's not really addressed as an issue, but here's this really progressive experiment um, that is very, that has evangelical relationships, but it's a very different kind of thing and really very influential and important. So I got interested from that perspective. The second perspective was there's this sort of um, common sense understanding that AIDS is what changed the trajectory of gay rights in the United States. And I was wondering if that was true or not, Mm -hmm. especially in American religion, because I think the way that gay rights and sexuality has unfolded in American Protestantism and specifically is what I'm talking about, That's not a linear development by any stretch of the imagination. And the achievement of actual LGBT acceptance, LGBT leadership, LGBT affirmation is rocky and contested and not linear and by no means complete or achieved as just the story of the United Methodists would let you know. So I was interested in really thinking through with a very tangible case that really intertwines questions of HIV and LGBT rights as a historical phenomenon how that case would impact the way that story gets told. So amazing. What is the status of this cassette archive that you have? Like, is this like, tell me about the, tell me about the physical nature of the, of this archive that you have. Well, so like I said, this archive was preserved by one man. So in 2007, the congregation was leaving the building that it had inhabited because the building was no longer fit for habitation for service. It was, uh, it was crumbling basically. And apparently these these boxes of tapes were slated for the trash. They were sitting by a trash bin and this one man um, found them, picked them up, slid them underneath the floor in the sound room and nobody knew that he had them. And so he literally one-handedly preserved them in a hidden space that nobody was aware of. And when he told me about it, I was working with a group of students at Berkeley and I got, they 
pulled box after box after box after box of cassettes out from under the floor. And <laughs> it was it was like it was never ending, right? It was like a never ending pile of boxes that was just like, oh my God, how what is this? Unbelievable. So, it was incredible. So the very first step was just like, what is in here? Like, what's the list? What are the dates? And every tape had a date and the name of the person who was preaching and just getting that list. I mean, it's 1200 cassettes. There's a lot of them. Oh my so, God. Yeah. It's, so it's truly incredible. My mind is blown right now. It is totally amazing. It is completely incredible. And it's, um, and it's a vaster archive than I than one person can deal with, right? 1,200 cassettes, that's more than I could do. Um, but I worked with a team of Berkeley undergrads and we set out to digitize 325. We've digitized about a quarter of the collection. So, and that is now the database from which I work. But I am currently working with the church about donating that archive to a permanent archival location, which is not a done deal yet. So I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I would say it is on its way to a permanent home that will love it and take care of it and preserve it for future historians. And there is so much work to be done on these materials. I mean, I can only touch like a minor fraction of them. Lynn, that is one of the most amazing things I think I've ever heard on this show. Like, I'm so thrilled by that. It's pretty awesome and super exciting. And I am so glad they're getting a good home. It will be a really happy, happy day when those tapes find their their long-term archival place. Well, let's dive into some specific information about the, the denomination itself, about the congregation itself. I've got so many questions. Um, so I'm curious about just the denomination, like the big picture organization. Um, so if you if I say the words Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches, I, I think that that's something that a lot of people might not even know about, something that might be overlooked in a huge amount of the public's you know knowledge about our country. Can you tell me a little bit about what makes the denomination itself sort of unique? among Christian denominations in the religion? It's a fascinating story. I'm writing a history of the MCC congregation in San Francisco, but there is such a, such a call for a true intellectual history of the denomination itself. And I really urge people to work on it because it's a fascinating intellectual enterprise. So the denomination, well, the first MCC event to occur was in 1968, uh, Pentecostal minister named Troy Perry held a worship service in his living room. So he had been a minister in the Church of God of Prophecy, and he, his sexuality was revealed to his congregation once, and he repented and said he was going to do better. He found another pulpit, his sexuality was revealed twice, and he was like, God wants me to be gay, I'm kind of okay with it. Um, so see you around. I'm moving to LA and I'm figuring myself out. And in the course of figuring himself out, he came to believe that God called him to found a church that would be open and accepting to gay and lesbian people. So he put an ad in the advocate and said on such and such a date and on a Sunday in October, I'm having a worship service in my house in LA. You, if you're gay and you're a believer and you want to, you should come over to my house and we'll have communion and it'll be awesome. So that was the beginning. And I love it. Yeah, it's a great story. And so Troy is a really interesting guy. He was raised in Florida and he was raised in Georgia and he was raised in a Pentecostal denomination. So he comes from the real evangelical side spectrum in American Protestantism. And he very much embodies that spirit. So if you listen to a video, he has a very strong Southern accent. He has a very um, sort of robust preaching style that's very evocative and very, um, it's sort of patterned in a very Pentecostal evangelical manner. He's, he's a great embodiment of that strand of American Christianity. Mm. When he started the church, well, here's what he hoped. He hoped that MCC spaces would be a place for gay and lesbian Christians to come for like two years until the denominations realized that they were being kind of jerks to gay people and welcome them back with open arms. So this was like a two year long experiment is what he imagined. Well, three years in, or yeah, four years in, they realized, hey, these denominations are not gonna do that. This is gonna be a long struggle and we need to organize ourselves if we're gonna do that. So they decided to take on a denominational form. 
So here's the thing that's interesting about that denominational form. So it was the first Christian group denomination that was open and accepting of gay and lesbian people. And at the time, almost every other denomination was not open and accepting to, to gay people. So if you're a gay Christian believer and you wanted a space that affirmed yourself and you affirmed your relationship, you went to the MCC. So what you got at MCC congregations were gay and lesbian Christians from every single point in the American Protestant and even the American Christian spectrum. So people who come from traditions that in Christian history have been fighting each other over the minutiae of baptism for hundreds of years are coming together every <laughs> Sunday trying to figure out how to do a worship service together because half of them are Pentecostals and want to speak in tongues. The other half are Catholics. There's a couple of random Presbyterians in the back or or Baptists who are mortified by people speaking in tongues. You know, there are people that want their clergy to wear robes and process with incense and be extremely formal. There are other people who want religious leadership to emerge from a congregation to just to wear jeans and whatever they're wearing and to speak the truth spontaneously. There's that entire spectrum. And they all have to figure out how to make it work together, which was is a very fascinating experiment. Unbelievable. How was Reverend Perry's um, experiment received broadly in 1960s United States? Like, I'm assuming he was in LA, maybe got a physical space. Like, how did that reception go in the broader public? Well, it went differently in different publics. For, well, first of all, it inspired a lot of the other gay Christian experiments that happened and they all happened afterwards. So a couple of years after he founded MCC, Dignity gets founded, which, uh, which is an outreach to gay and lesbian Catholics. Integrity, which is the version of that for the Episcopal church. And then a number of the Protestant denominations started gay caucuses within their own denominations. So the mm. caucuses of gay people in the United Methodists, in the Lutherans who want to think about, talk about and consider gay concerns, but within the denominational context. So one thing that starts to happen among gay and lesbian Christians is do you go to the MCC, which is a gay oriented thing, or do you try to make change in your home denomination? You know, where can you fit and where do you want to take this fight? So that's something that happens. Um, Perry himself has a lot of appeal for gay people who were raised in evangelical and Pentecostal backgrounds. He feels like home. His church services feel like home. For gay and lesbian Christians raised in other backgrounds, he is a shock. He seems to be very contrary to what um, Christianity is for some people, what gay rights are for some people. He seems to be coming from a very different location. So one of the things I always find interesting is that MCC is not a liberal church per se. Like I think most people, when they think about gay affirming churches, they think the difference between liberal and conservative and liberals are the ones who are more open and conservatives. Well, MCC messes with all those categories. They mm. queer all those categories because here he is, this very Pentecostal evangelical guy. Um, and here are these congregations, some of which are very progressive, like the one that I'm studying, but some of which are basically evangelical, conservative, theologically evangelical churches that just are okay with gay people. You get the entire gamut of theological diversity, which some people think is their great experiment and, and for others is really distancing and off-putting. And then in the larger gay community, again, you get a really diverse mix of responses because there's a lot of people in LGBT rights and organizing that are suspicious of religion right at the get-go. And then they see somebody like Perry who in a certain kind of imagination looks like what gay rights opponents looks like or sounds like what gay rights opponents look like and there's a lot of suspicion and there's a lot of distance. But again, for other people, it's life giving. It's a place they can go to church with their partners, hold their hands, kiss them in public, be recognized as human beings, and that they can, and that by settling the question about whether or not God loves gay people, by having a church that says, this is not even a conversation. God loves gay people, period. Now let's see what we can do, as opposed to let's have a fight over whether or not gay. God loves gay people, you get a whole different set of possibilities and a whole different set of experiments. And every MCC congregation lived that experiment in different ways. That is truly amazing. Do you have any sense today in 2021 as of this recording, like 
how large the denomination is. Um, do we have any figures or statistics or anything like that on MCC denominations around the country or around the world? Yeah, well, according to their website, they have a presence in 20 countries um, around the world and in almost all states, including Washington, D.C. Um, they currently have 222 member congregations is the number that they give. They don't give numbers on current statistics. And because my work ends in 1999 and is focused on San Francisco, I don't really have much more data than that. Totally but fine. As, as a point of comparison, um, in 1981, when the church applied, then when the denomination applied to be a member of the National Council of Churches, they had 176 congregations. So it's gotten bigger, but not hugely bigger. And the impact of HIV in terms of decimation of MCC's leadership and really um, putting their growth process into a truncated place was, it can't be overstated, the impact well, of HIV on that. Well, let's dive into that. So the Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco is a place that was well known in the 80s and 90s and throughout the AIDS epidemic. Um, today, you know, there are other churches that are open and affirming that have ordained LGBTQIA pastors, but and we know that MCC was founded in the 60s, but you know, I, I'm I'm curious about the stigma around trying to about being a Christian and being gay in the 1980s. And when AIDS emerged in the public sphere of attention. So can you tell me a little bit about what the conversation was like in the 80s um, around people who were gay and Christian? What was that sense like? It was a tumultuous moment to be a gay Christian. It was contested. It was contested in ways that I think we're more culturally familiar with. There was, so 1980, Ronald Reagan gets elected. He's elected in part because Jerry Falwell has been able to mobilize the moral majority. He's able to mobilize the moral majority in part because Anita Bryant had been so successful in Dade County in Florida in 1977 in overcoming a gay rights ordinance in Dade County. So there is this real mobilization of the Christian right and the Christian right has really set its sights on gay and lesbian people and truncating gay and lesbian public existence, public rights, legal rights, and therefore increasingly identified as an enemy to gay rights activists, lesbian activists, um, LGBT people trying to seek equality. So there's this increasing dichotomy of um, gay and religious, and there's this uh, current that is pulling those two identities increasingly apart. In, in large part because of political pressure. And then you get the introduction of HIV um, and the vocal response on the part of some Christian right leaders interpreting the emergence of this brutal, brutal, brutal disease as something that God wanted and that God revels in and that is a message that God is telling all of us about the status of LGBT people and particularly gay men. And it becomes, for many, and for good reason, just unforgivable. It's an unforgivable depiction. Um, so for many LGBT people who are seeking a spiritual life, the question of whether or not you could find it in a Christian church was really up. And for a lot of people that was assumed to be completely impossible. Mm. I will also say that in San Francisco, right as right as HIV emerges, there are also some very interesting gay religious experiments um, in public theology, in public discourse, and in trying to shape the Christian church by and with gay and lesbian people. So it's a counter history to that. It's, it's a very, it, so for example, in the Catholic church, in, in the archdiocese in San Francisco in 1982, there's a for the first time ever, there's a document produced by a diocesan body that is written by an out gay man, a, a theologian, that is about affirming the place of gay and lesbians in the Catholic Church. It was a fight, it was defeated, but it happened, which is mm. something that people don't really remember. So there is also this countercurrent of organizing that's going on. But there's increasingly a sense, especially as HIV progresses, that gay and religious, you kind of have to pick. And so what's important and significant about 
um, and MCC Church is that they're saying, no, we're not going to pick. We don't have to pick and we're not going to pick and we're going to find a way through this together. But we're not equivocating again on the question of whether or not God loves gay people. That is not a question that is entertained here. That is a given. Mm. Um, and particularly in a moment with HIV, I mean, part of the tragedy of the alienation from religion of HIV is that in a moment like that, there are some very intense spiritual needs that are generated in the community and where are they going to get met? And so MCC really tried to delineate a space where those needs could get met um, within a religious context that was both very rooted in the Christian tradition and also expansive beyond it. Mm, I'm curious as well about, you know, in the society where all these stigmas were so present, what the essentialness of the Castro in San Francisco plays into this. Tell me about the Castro in the early 80s. Yeah, the Castro is an interesting place with a very interesting story. So the Castro is sort of the quintessential gay neighborhood. And so what's a gay neighborhood? Well, for many, many years in American cities, there are districts or places in the city where sexual activity occurs, where sexual minorities congregate, where all kinds of minorities congregate. They're red light districts. They're, um, you know, the sex part of town. They're the place where stuff happens. There, There's where people who are, are marginalized in all kinds of ways tend to gather and those places get reputations. And in terms of queer life, a lot of those places get reputations for being sexually active places. What a gay neighborhood did was that it said, sexual minorities are gonna live here. They're gonna not just go there to have sex or you know, party with their comrades and then go home to their suburbs or their other neighborhoods. We're gonna make a life here. We're gonna have gay supermarkets and we're gonna have gay bookstores and we're gonna have the gay insurance agent and we're gonna have the gay florist and we're gonna make a neighborhood. We're gonna, we're gonna expand gay life beyond sex and create like a village of wide ranging gay space, gay. And I say gay, I mean, it's, there's lesbians that live in Castro, there's all kinds of queer people, there's LGBT people, but the Castro in particular, and many of these gay neighborhoods tend to be identified as gay male space. So I'm saying that word intentionally. Mm. Um, and so MCC, which is located, which in 1979 moves to the Castro, then becomes the neighborhood church. And so it's not, just a uh, congregation in a random place that's open to LGBT people, but it's a neighborhood church in walking distance from the center of the Castro that's being supported by a gay neighborhood in a gay context with a gay political strategy and a gay political infrastructure, a gay cultural infrastructure, and it becomes part of that ecosystem which again allows it to do some things that even open and affirming congregations in other places can't really do because it's really sort of taking in the ecosystem of a, of a neighborhood. I love it. Well, the last time I was in the Castro, I went and bought these hand knitted sweaters for my little dog that she still wears. So I have, <laughs> I, I have a, I have, that sounds dog, right. <laughs> yeah, I have I have dog sweaters that were hand knitted in the Castro that I bought there, and this dog absolutely loves it. She's a little diva, so she loves it when she gets to wear her little fancy sweaters. Um, That's awesome! I love it. <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, and, uh, so we we've kind of established this church here. It's on uh, Eureka Street, and. If, if, ever, if anybody goes on Google Maps, you can still type in the address of the church and you can still see a picture of it on Eureka Street. It's got some boards over the front door because as you mentioned earlier, there were some physical problems with the structure itself, but you can still see it on Google Maps, which I just did about 30 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm curious what some of the people in reviewing your work, these names come out in your writing, Reverend Jim Matolsky, Bishop Yvette Flunger, Reverend Steve Peters. Can you tell the listeners about some of the essential figures of MCC San Francisco and your experiences of working with these with these fine folks? Yeah, um, it's a great story in part because um, MCC San Francisco itself generated this amazing cohort or group of gay Christian leaders and gay Christian leaders in the sense of clergy and in the sense of just lay leadership. They were really committed to lay leadership. And they also became this really interesting incubator for gay and lesbian leaders who went out into other churches, other denominations and hugely forwarded gay rights in other denominations and in other spaces. So 
an example of sort of the homegrown leadership is Reverend Jim Matulski, who was the pastor of MCC San Francisco from 1987 to 1999, um, no, 1986, excuse me. He started in 1986. He became the pastor of MCC San Francisco when he was 27 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and he comes in in 1986, which is five years after the first cases of HIV are documented. And it's a time when AIDS is just ravaging the community. I mean, it's it's ravaging the Castro. When you walked out on the streets in the Castro in the 80s, you saw men physically wasting away before your eyes, men walking with IVs, men in wheelchairs, young men in wheelchairs, not old men in wheelchairs, maybe some young men who look like old men, but young men in wheelchairs. It, the, the pervasive sense of illness was just um, inescapable. And here's this, 27 year old guy who is coming, he came from MCC in New York, he moves to San Francisco to a congregation that has a long history before him and is a very well-developed congregation. This is a congregation that has its own leadership. It has its own structure. It had been led by lay leaders for the two previous years. So they were, it's one of these cases of a congregation and a community meeting a leader and then the two really taking the next steps together into the AIDS years. Um, Jim Matulski was raised as a Catholic. Um, he grew up in Detroit. He became an MCC minister because he saw in MCC the potential for a real gay liberation experiment, an experiment in gay liberation theology like he had been trained at. And then when he came to MCC San Francisco, he realized that there is a an AIDS liberation theology and an AIDS liberation moment that this congregation could really take on and make into a whole new thing. And he became, he is widely recognized as the minister who did the most AIDS funerals in San Francisco in these years. He mm -hmm. did more AIDS memorials than probably anyone, certainly anyone in San Francisco. And he got up in that pulpit and every week he would bring together stories from scripture because he is a huge um, believer in scripture and it, from gay and lesbian literature because he's also a huge reader of gay and lesbian literature. And he would bring these sort of two streams of discourse together every week to sort of make some kind of meaning for this congregation about what they were living through and how to understand it and how to act, how to be together through it. And I think one of the messages that really comes through his preaching in that time is that we have to hold on to this together. Like we are gonna get through this by staying together and staying and just stay here together, do this with us. One of the um, sermons he preached a lot about, which I really love is about the death of the prophet Elijah and Elijah's student, Elisha. And it's a story from the Bible about um, the prophet Elijah's death and, and Elijah knows that he's about to die and he tells a student, you know, I gotta go. I'm going sometime soon. I'm, I'm doing a terrible version of this, but here we go. So uh, Elijah's like, I'm dying soon. Alicia's like, I don't care. I'm coming with you. And all the people around Alicia are going, you know, Elijah is going to die soon. And Alicia's like, I don't care. I'm coming with you. And Elijah's like, seriously, I need to go to this place. I'm going to die. Like, and Alicia's like, I don't care. I'm coming with you. Um, and Elijah says to Alicia, um, it, and, and Alicia asks Elijah, how can I get your a double share of your blessing? And Elijah says, if you are with me through this and you watch as this happens, you'll get a double share of my blessing. And he tells that story over and over about people, you will get a blessing by staying through this. Not everybody mm. can stay with people through this. Not everybody is able to. And you're having to do it a lot, but just stay, you know, just be here with us in this and we will go through this. And it's such a brave and scary and it, it was the kind it was the kind of sermon that got you through from week to week that made it possible to sit through the next week and then through the next week and through the next week. Mm. Um, yeah. He's a very interesting guy. I could say more about him, but you asked about other people. So like I said, the other thing that MCC was really able to do was sort of generate leadership in other gay Christian experiments and support other leadership in gay Christian experiments. And two examples come to mind. One is Janie Spar, which if people know her, they tend to think about her as a lesbian activist in the Presbyterian church. She, bless her heart, went through two trials, legal trials in the Presbyterian 
Presbyterian Church because the first time because she was uh, called to a pulpit as an out lesbian minister and that was um, contested by others in the Presbytery and she was not allowed to take on this congregational position as an out lesbian minister in the Presbyterian Church. And the second time because she was performing same sex weddings. Mm. So Janie Spar is a leading light in the Presbyterian Church and again, most people who know her know her for that. But she was a minister in MCC San Francisco in the early 80s. She had just come out. She'd been kicked out of the Presbyterian Church for being a lesbian, but she knew that she was called to be a minister in the church and to gay and lesbian people. And she came as a guest preacher in 1980 at MCC San Francisco. And the congregation so loved her that they spontaneously raised money for her that night to pay for her salary to come on the staff of that church. I love and it. She spent, I know, it's amazing. So she spent two years in that congregation. She describes it as the time that she really understood what it meant to be queer clergy. And when it was time for her to leave, they anointed her as the, um, the lesbian evangelist to the denominations. Mm. And so over all the years that I have recordings of her, she keeps coming back to that church, reporting on what's happening to the Presbyter in the Presbyterian church, gaining their support for all of her struggles in that church and constantly being in conversation with that community about how things are happening in this other gay Christian context. And then the other great example is the person that you mentioned, Yvette Flunder, who folks probably know today as the founder of um, City of Refuge, which is a LGBT affirming African-American congregation in Oakland. Well, it started as Ark of Refuge, which was the first, to my knowledge, the first African-American response to HIV in the black church that she started in San Francisco. And over the years, she and Jim Matulski were in constant conversation about how she could build City of Refuge as a Black LGBTQ congregation. She was in conversation with many people, but she was a guest preacher at MCC starting in the late 80s. She came every year. And over all of the years that I am studying, City of Refuge developed as a congregation that was that sort of saw itself as a sibling congregation to MCC San Francisco. And MCC San Francisco really felt that that um, as a congregation committed to anti-racism, supporting the development of a black identified LGBT congregation was something very important to them in their mission. And they sort of walked in tandem together um, for decades and Matulski and Yvette Flunder still walk in tandem together. I mean, it's it's just so amazing. Um, you know, you as the historian telling these stories, it's a it's a it's a massive responsibility if you think about it. And I'm curious if you can tell me a little bit about your relationship building, your trust establishment process for telling such delicate and emotional histories. How do you handle that on your end? I love that question so much. I love everything about that question because that matters so much to me. And it's um, and it's not something we talk about a lot. So I really appreciate you asking it. I will ask it again if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It matters um, to me. The question matters to me a whole lot. I'm not even, I'm not joking with you at all. I love that. I, I'm, I'm, I just think that it's such an important question to ask. And I, I try to ask that question as often as I can um, with historians about, you know, relationships and trust because it's so crucial. It's one of the most essential ingredients I can imagine. Yeah. And it's something that's been especially challenging to me as a scholar working sometimes inside of the academy and now largely outside of the academy in thinking about how I do that. And one of the great graces of working outside of the academy is it allows me to do it in the way that I see fit, mm. which I don't know would really fly in the same way in the academy. So that matters to me. So when I first started this project, there was a guy in the congregation named Jimmy and he came up to me and he was like, if you think you are coming in this community for a year and then leaving and writing a book about us, you just need to fucking leave right now because we will not have it. Like if you are in this, you got to stay in this. And that was 10, that was 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the things that's been really important and a challenge to me is that this is a long, long-term project. Yeah. And at this point, I mean, it helps that I had had a relationship with the church for a long time before it started, but 
at this point, um, I what it's allowed me to do is build very long-term relationships with the people that I interview and the people that I talk with and the congregation itself. So it means that I'm able to do long interviews over years. I, For my last project, a long interview in my book was two hours. Now a short interview in my <laughs> for this project is two hours. I interview people over and over and over again. I interview them multiple times. I have eight, 10, 12 hours of recorded material with them. And that doesn't include the, like, as you say, the relationship building, like the initial conversations, the going to people's houses and having coffee with them before we start and really giving into the time for that. And it's been a real process for me as a scholar to be like, no, I'm giving into the time for that because these people have sacred, important stories that they want to share with me. And I have to give them their full their full due and their full social due and their full social respect and their full sort of ongoing that I need to see all of them as ongoing conversations and I do. So Jim Matulski, for example, I started interviewing him in 2015. We've done six formal interview sessions and we have more scheduled and we have many informal conversations over time. There are some people that I interview only once, usually leaders in other congregations that aren't central to this, but this has been a long project of developing relationships over time and being in conversation over time. The other thing that's really important to me, and I tell my interview subjects this, and it's something again that being not in the academy allows me to do, is that I say, I'm interviewing for the archive. So you have stories that I wanna hear that I'm not gonna be able to write about because I am one person writing one book, maybe two, but I'm not gonna be able to tell all these stories. But all of these interviews are meant for the archive. So if you have stories to tell, even if they're not about something that I necessarily write about, or even is at the center of my interest, you should tell me, I wanna preserve them. They're gonna be preserved and they're gonna be held in an archival space that will allow somebody someday to find some way or reason to tell them. And for me, being able to say, look, an archive is gonna hold them means that I don't personally have to hold all these stories. I'm the person who's receiving them in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I feel a responsibility to preserve them, but I don't feel the responsibility to have to do justice to every last thing that every person tells me because I know it's gonna be held in common with me and other historians of my generation and future historians to hold. So it feels like a collective experiment and there's a real process for me of settling in both to the time commitment that it takes to really develop relationships over the long term, and the sort of collective feeling of like, yeah, it's in this one-on-one -on -one interaction that these things get transmitted, but we're all holding this together. Like you lived it, I'm studying it. I know the cohort of academics who study these questions. I know we all love and care for these stories and that that will continue on. And it makes it um, kind of easier to hold, you know? Yeah, Does that make well, sense? absolutely. Well, you know, I, I've actually had a similar experience. Um, a couple of years back, I interviewed Joan and Ann Watts, who are the two eldest daughters of Alan Watts, um, oh. the notable philosopher and writer who is associated with the Bay Area where you are. And I got an email from a historian a few months later saying, wow, those interviews with the children of Alan Watts are amazing. And when people write about him in the future, like they very well may listen to your interviews. And even though you're just putting them out for people now today to listen to casually while they like walk their dog or something, those things could become actual artifacts in the future that people mine for data that hadn't really been thought about before. You know what I mean? So you getting those conversations down and recorded even if you don't personally do anything beyond record it, if it's available to other people, you never know what's going to happen with those materials then. And that's, that's where there's so, there's so much promise there, so much potential, you know? I think it really matters. I know it really matters to people to have their stories heard and to be able to see their lives as um, subjects of historical interest. There's also the ways in which queer lives are radically underdocumented. And in San Francisco, in particular, the way that religious lives in San Francisco religion is really underdocumented. And so I feel like the archive I'm developing, which is a companion archive to the one that MCC has with its tapes, um, is really filling a void in documentation and archiving. 
that I think is really important. Um, I have some questions about worship at MCC in San Francisco at the height of the AIDS epidemic and how MCC navigated an altered form of worship where people could be both Christian and LGBT. In a piece you did for Religion Dispatches, you write about, quote, how MCC San Francisco shaped ritual around the experiences of AIDS. And that, that line captured me. Um, rituals centered around an often shunned group to feel loved and cared for. Tell me about a typical service at MCC in the 80s and how it varied from other Christian groups in the country. Like, I'm curious about examples like ranging from either communion to pastoral clothing to sermon themes, same sex marriage, anything that springs to mind that stands out to you as ritual centered around uh, the experience of AIDS. Well, let me talk about communion first, because in some ways it's it's the most enduring example. I think it's what people from the congregation would bring up first if you ask them that question. So at the very first MCC worship service in Troy Perry's living room, he had an open communion, which meant that anybody could receive it. And that matters because for a lot of gay, lesbian, Christians, access to the Eucharist was wrapped up in sexual identity. And to the extent to which gay and lesbian Christians either believe themselves to be in some kind of fallen state, or the leaders of a church considered gay and lesbian people to be in some kind of fallen state, the question of whether or not they could legitimately access communion, the Eucharist, um, was very, very freighted. So people had to make the decision about whether they were in the kind of religious state that would allow them to receive communion. And the religious leaders would have to make a determination whether they thought that eligibility was met. Troy Perry was like, fuck that. Like this is, we are open to all people and all people who want access to the communion table have it here. What that came to look like over the years and as that practice evolved was that communion was a space where people would go to receive communion in their queer kinship groups, whatever that looked like. So people would go with their partners of the same sex, holding hands, touching each other's back, going together to a minister of the church and having communion placed in their mouths, placed in their hands together um, in public. People who were in queer kinship formations, like your lover, your roommate, and your sister who's visiting from Ontario, and mm -hmm. um, your ex who is the bartender who you still love more than anybody in your life and is your best friend, like all five of you come up together and have communion consecrated together and having your queer kinship network recognized. So when I interview a lot of people about what struck them at their first MCC services, they say the experience of going there and seeing two men go up together and receive communion in a sacred, sacralized manner was life-changing in mm. a church context. So this is whether you get gay married or not, whether you have holy unions or not, which is a whole nother conversation. The visible, non-sexual, but deeply bodily affirmation of the relationships that are holy to this community being publicly visible and sacralized in that way was just a game changer, a life changer, like a psychic DNA changer for a lot of people there. Mm. So then you get HIV and you get people in very various stages of being able to access HIV, uh, excuse me, um, communion because people are sick and people can't stand for very long. Um, people are coming to church with IV poles. People are having to clear the pews so sick members can just lay down through the whole service. Um, in the AZT years on the recordings, you can start hearing watch timers. And the reason you can start hearing watch timers is because the original prescription for AZT was very tied to time, you had to take the drugs at very, very specific times. So everybody had an alarm on their clock about wow. when they needed to take their drugs. And you could hear it in the recordings, like bzz, 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 wow. everybody with their different yeah, times. So what, and then the other thing that happened during HIV is that nobody wanted to touch people with AIDS because they're very, very sick. And AIDS was a very, very stigmatized disease and people were terrified of contagion, even if there was no means of contagion in any given situation. And 
a lot of, one of the ways that HIV manifested was through chaos, Kaposi's sarcoma, which were big purple bruise-like lesions that would be all over a person's face and body. And people were afraid of touching. So one of the things MCC San Francisco did is that on the fourth Sunday of the month, they started instituting a healing service, which meant people could go up for communion, but not just communion, they could go up to be touched, to have a laying on of hands, where one, two, three clergy people would anoint your head with oil and physically touch you and lay hands on you to pray. And if you could, if you were too sick to get up, the clergy would get into the pew and they would come while you were laying on the pew, while you were laying. We have a interview with somebody who describes having his friend lay, having his head on his lap and laying across the laps of four other men down the pews and clergy coming to them to give this man communion because he was too sick to get up and move. Mm. So they did what they had to do to get communion to the people who needed it. And if they couldn't get up, they went to them. If they could, if they needed to go first, they went first. If um, the reason actually they, there are cassettes is because the deacons in the church started bringing communion to people who were too sick to come to church. And in 1987, when they started recording, they came with cassette tapes. So they, so they would bring communion and a copy of that week's worship service to people who were too sick to come to church. Wow. So they did whatever they had to do to make the space friendly for people with AIDS to be in social physical space together, which was not something they could do in any space in the world and to be touched and to be loved and to be, and to be physically present in whatever shape they could. And when they couldn't, they came to them with communion and little cassette tapes. Which Amazing. I spend my life with. Yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Well, and you have a, a book chapter that you wrote a few years back um, about the 1989 Christmas um, at the church. And it's in the book, Devotions and Desires, Histories of Sexuality and Religion in the 20th Century United States from the University of North Carolina Press. Some other friends of the podcast are in that book, Judith Weisenfeld, Samira, Samira Mehta, um, which is really cool. I love seeing the ways that this podcast overlaps with other people's projects. But your chapter is called We Who Must Die Demand a Miracle, Christmas 1989 at the Metropolitan Community Church of San Francisco. And so for anybody out there listening, I want can you set the stage for this Christmas service and why it's such a standout experience that you documented so carefully? 1989 was a really intense year. <laughs> and it was a year of um, three steps forward and two steps back in a lot of different ways. It was a year of a lot of possibility for change and a lot of disappointment. And let me give you some examples. So 1989, it's eight years since the very first reports of HIV that there's a new disease out there. It's five years since the virus has been identified. So this community went for three years knowing that there's a deadly disease without knowing what caused it. I mean, if you think about the COVID comparison now that within a year for all of its tragedies and they are manifold, they knew what the virus was pretty soon. <laughs> it mm -hmm. took three years. 1989 is two years since is two years after there was a treatment for the first time. AZT was the first actual viable medical treatment. It's two years since then, but it's six full years before the AIDS cocktail will really actually change the epidemiology of the disease and actually help people survive. So it's eight years in and six years before it's gonna change for this community. And then what's happening politically in 1989, again, is this one, two steps forward, three steps back kind of situation. So in the city of San Francisco, they pass a domestic partnership law. Um, the Board of Supervisors passes it, which allows gay people to register as domestic partners for the first time. And six months later, it's rescinded on the ballot. And then in the city of Concord, which is a couple of miles from San Francisco, it's in the Bay Area, their Board of Supervisors their Board of Supervisors passes an anti-AIDS discrimination law that makes it illegal to discriminate against people with AIDS. Huge step forward. Six months later, it's rescinded on the ballot. So political leaders are making these advances for gay people and people with AIDS. And then the popular vote is then pulling them out from under their feet. Mm. In October, two months before this, um, the San Francisco police um, 
beat a set of ACT UP protesters off the street in the Castro. And then a week later, there's the Loma Prieta earthquake. So the entire city is literally erupted and the infrastructure is falling apart and you get it all plague hurricane natural disaster the whole thing and there they are on christmas being like how what the hell do you do on christmas in a moment such as this like what do you do like how do you celebrate where is the hope in that mm. um so i really focused on that because it was such an intense moment and then for somebody like matulski who was the pastor to pick this phrase from a wh autumn poem we who must die demand a miracle and to organize a sermon around that demand just seems so badass to me it just seemed mm. like such a badass way to respond to that moment um looking on the tragedy full face and yet still saying no we're going to make a demand here and we're going to demand the most outlandish thing you can demand which is a miracle you don't demand a miracle like maybe you get a miracle or you happen a long one but demand one like who do you think you are but that's who they thought they were which i just find i found very very moving yeah. so cool um you know, the imagery Matulski uses, it, it, like with the pink and purple church, as well as like evoking Palestine and the inn of Christ's birth, it seems important here to me. Um, what would you say about some of these parallels? Because I found that to be so interesting. Yeah, so he really used the sermon. One of the things he really wanted to do in general was to show gay Christians that they are part of this history, that their history is relevant to the larger Christian story and that their history matters to God and that God sees them in the way that God sees the people that we all kind of more widely recognize as people that God is concerned about, that God picks people like the people who go to this church to be messengers of God's um, message and God's work and as instruments of God's work. So he basically takes the Christmas story and every step of the way he makes parallels to how what was happening in Palestine when Jesus was born has its parallels with what's happening to the gay and lesbian community in the church in that moment. So for one example, just for one example, he talks about um, Mary and Joseph, um, an unmarried couple um, who are pregnant, who are domestic partners, because it's domestic partner legislation here, um, are, are, are coming to um, the inn, and there's no room at the inn for that. And that, and, that, and that God therefore understands and blesses domestic partnership, that there's a wide range of kinship that is recognized here in this place, or that the political situation that Mary and Joseph were facing were akin to the political situation that MCC San Francisco was facing in San Francisco or that gay and lesbian people were um, experiencing in San Francisco. He just continues to make these parallels through the whole entire thing about how that reads gay Christian experience into the scriptures and makes it clear that they are the kinds of people that God really minds, care for, cares for and uses to God's liberatory ends, yeah. Lynn, I'm curious about your emotional weight that you carry as a scholar, as a person trying to tell these heart-wrenching stories. Like how are, how is your personal health with all of the like while you're carrying these heavy stories around because the emotional weight of it all I feel like would be so challenging. So I'm curious how you personally deal with that. Yeah. Another great question. You asked really good questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad I can have the time with it that I think it necessitates and allows me to sort of sit in the grief of it and then also not dwell in the grief of it, that I don't have to truncate the grief of it. Um, and I don't have to... Um, kind of short circuit around it for the purposes of academic production. Um, but it does, um, it, it takes its emotional toll for sure. And there's a way in which I, like sometimes I feel a little bit like um, a weird little monk or devotee that is like just like keeping the, the candles lit for these stories and these people, some of whom are still alive, some of whom are no longer alive, trying to keep, to bear witness to their stories and to hold it. Um, 
And sometimes that feels like the grief of it is something that I can feel really tangibly. It's also this experience of like, you can feel, I can start to feel those people around me in some kind of, you know, psychic way that I feel like I have a certain kind of presence. So I often have this experience. I live not too far from the Castro in 2021 and in all the years that I've been doing this. And yet half my head is in this very same location, like 30 years earlier. And it's weird as hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just weird as hell <laughs> to be like, where am I in time? Where am I in place? I'm very confused. Um, but it's a practice to hold such sacred memories and to hold loss and grief that I have not known personally, that I can see in my interview subjects have so profoundly shaped their lives. And in some cases just broke their, their parts of their psyches and their emotional lives that, in ways that can't be repaired. Mm. And it's, it's intense to know that and to see it and to hold the stories as somebody who is hearing them, but will never have lived them in that way. And to, and to really take seriously the trust that is, that's given to me in, in holding them. Um, but there's also a grace in not having lived them because, you know, you can hold them more lightly and not be broken in quite the same ways that the people who live through them are broken. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, the the iconic location of the original church on Eureka Street is no more, and they've moved over to Polk Street. Um, do you have any other de uh, details on the story of the move or anything like that, or how the congregation is functioning now that it's in a different location? Well, one of the things that was great about being a historian is that I was able, so they moved, they are now sharing space with the First Congregational Church in San Francisco, which to that generation of leaders was a new relationship. But through my work, I was able to show that in 1987, when the Pope came to San Francisco and all the LGBT religious organizations gathered together to do a counter protest, um, it was held at the First Congregational Church of San Francisco and they were co-sponsors together in this event. That There had been a much longer congregational history than anybody had actually remembered, which is really- Fabulous. Cool. Yeah, it was really awesome. Um, they're meeting almost exclusively virtually at this point because the congregation is elderly and has a lot of COVID risk and they know how to get through a plague together and they're doing it that way for the most part right now. Um, it's kind of unclear where they're gonna be located for the long term and I think they're really a discernment process trying to figure that out but they know a lot like i say about living through epidemics and they're doing what they have to to get through it wonderful well lynn i've kept you forever but these stories were so interesting to me and i'm so grateful to you for your your energy and your work and your attention to this magnificent archive that uh, that you and your colleagues are unpacking, I would imagine that some of the you know the the, the leaders in the congregation, like Reverend Matolsky and everybody else, would be really excited to get a digital file of a thirty year old sermon after you have it digitized. I mean, how's that process gone for you for being like, hey, guess what? I just digitized a new sermon from nineteen eighty eight. Here you go. Like, how has that gone? Well, here's the thing. It's a you asked a great question. So Jim Matulski, his preaching style is he takes a bit of scripture. He takes a thing that he read that week. He kind of brings it to the pulpit. And in the way he describes it is he reads the room that he, one of his pastoral and homiletic gifts is to be able to speak extemporaneously based on what he feels is happening in the congregation and what it needs to hear. What that means for a historian is that he's never written down a text of his sermon in his life. He's never had one. He's literally never had one. Wow. He doesn't write that way. So when my students and I were able to give him a hard drive with a hundred transcriptions of his sermons, he was kind of blown away. Oh my and, God, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And now that we're in conversation with this archive about permanently locating it, they were like, well, does Reverend Matulski have any sermons? I'm like, he doesn't, but I do. I have a hundred of them because we did the labor of getting them into some kind of form. And it's interesting because he's an extemporaneous preacher, reading a sermon of Jim Matulski's is a very different experience than hearing a, an, a sermon of Jim Matulski's and then hearing it in the context of what is happening in the congregation, like being able to hear the whole worship service, not just his sermon, like brings it 
brings all kinds of dimensions that you wouldn't necessarily get just reading it on the page. Mm, that is absolutely gorgeous. It kind of reminds yeah. me of like whenever I would show my students examples of a, a Quran recitation versus like, you know, in Arabic, uh, very tonally modulated while also like, or, or compared to like reading an English translation of the message of the Quran like on a page, very different experiences hearing and feeling it versus just like reading it out of like a paperback. Um, so that's kind of the, really different. yeah, that's like the comparison that I'm, that I'm drawing there. Well, that is so cool. Well, yeah. Lynn, tell me a little bit about your goals and timeline over the next couple of years of your scholarship. What do you have coming down the pipeline that you're excited about? Well, um, I'm working on a book on MCC San Francisco. So that's one project. And related, um, I'm also working on a book on religious responses to AIDS in San Francisco in general, in part because, as I said, there's a real hole in the history of religion in San Francisco, and AIDS is a great case to show what's happening in a lot of different religious sectors in the city at that time. So I'm working on that volume too. And then the public facing scholarship I'm doing with Siri Colum and Ariana Nettleman is more oriented in the audio archive and getting it out to a public audience. So right now, the three of us are working on a piece for the American Religion Sounds Project on a gallery exhibit on MCC San Francisco that'll feature a lot of clips of singing, of praying, of worship, of communion services, of the whole thing while telling the story of the church. And we're also working toward a narrative podcast that'll tell the story of this congregation using almost entirely audio archival materials. Oh my goodness. So the American Religious Sounds Project, that's Dr. Isaac Weiner's project, right, out of Ohio State? Yeah, and Dr. Amy DeRogatis's project, yeah. Tell me about that collaboration. Is that going well so far? Yeah, it's something that I can credit to Sacred Rights and Megan Goodwin, who really encouraged us to make that connection. And it's being the perfect, it's being a perfect like academic shidduch, like a perfect match, um, because they are really interested in telling the story of American religions through sound. And they've done incredible work in getting ethnographers out in the field to ha have contemporary examples of what religious experiences in America sound like to people. And they really get the evocation of sound and how that transports a person into a, a religious space, but they hadn't done a lot of historical work. And here we are with this rich, gorgeous historical archive and not exactly sure how to feature the sound part. Like I, like writing a book, it's not displaying sound. It's not giving people that sensorial experience. So this connection has really allowed them to expand in terms of historical archival material and giving us a form that kind of is somewhere between formal academic writing and a more popular narrative podcast that really allows us to feature like what the archive has to show. Do you have a title for your podcast yet? Yes, it's when we all get to heaven, which is the name of one of the, it's a very evangelical hymn that this congregation would sing many, many Sunday nights. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And for a congregation of gay and lesbian people who were told that they are not, they do not have a place in heaven. And for people who are very sick with a lethal disease, who were likely going to find out, many of them pretty soon, whether or not that was the case, to get up in front of a church every Sunday and to sing that song and that affirmation we think is like profoundly badass. And so we wanted to name our podcast after the song. Amazing. Yeah. I am so pumped that you're doing that project as a total podcast dork myself. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. And I am so excited that you get that people who are hearing our conversation will now know about your project. That makes me really happy. Well, Dr. Lynn Gerber, this has been a magnificent conversation about so many things that you are doing with your work. Where can people find you if they want to follow along, get in touch, et cetera? Tell people where to find you. Well, um, the podcast can be found at Heaven Podcast. Dot org and I'm at Gerber underscore Lynn on Twitter. I'm also on Facebook. I'm happy to be followed there. And I am so delighted by this conversation and your questions and your curiosity. It is just 
an honor and a joy and a privilege to be in conversation with you. I so appreciate your questions. You are just a great interviewer. And as somebody who interviews a lot, I know a good interviewer and your, your engagement, it's, it's, it's just an honor to be in the presence of it. So thank you for that. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. Support for this episode of Classical Ideas was provided by Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation project. Explore the work of Sacred Rights at sacred-rights.org.